Good morning. Good morning. So during an episode of the legendary 1970s comedy sketch show, Monty Python, the main character, played by Michael Palin, enters an office and inquires about purchasing an argument. Is this the right room for an argument, he asks. In the first room, he's subjected to personal abuse. Shut your festering gob, you tit. Your type makes me puke, you toffee-nosed, malodorous pervert. Before it becomes apparent that he's in the wrong room. In the next room, the character portrayed by John Cleese merely proceeds to contradict him. Uh, to which Palin suggests that this isn't even a proper argument. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. While the Pythons were actually making a wry comment about consumer society in which anything can be purchased, even an argument, the sketch actually highlights the lived experience of many people engaging in arguments online these days. You're either subjected to a torrent of personal abuse or else the level of argument never raises much above that of contradiction. Now, our lives are lived increasingly online and it is social media that is often the, the room in which we come for an argument. Uh, according to data from the Pew Research Center, around three in 10 US adults say that they are almost constantly online. Hootsuite has measured the, that we spend on average around six hours and 45 minutes online each day. Increasingly, we gather our news, find a partner, engage with family and friends, and shape our worldview via the small electronic window that cradles in the palm of our hand. Back in the pioneering days of the internet, many writers and commentators <laughs> talked about the potential liberating power of so much knowledge and information at our fingertips. Idealistic web pioneers like Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who is often referred to as the father of the web, imagined a utopian vision uh, of open debate and open source software, advancing our knowledge and understanding. Commenting upon the 30th anniversary of the web recently, Berners-Lee said that he understood that many people might feel unsure that the web was a force for good these days. But he was optimistic that it could be made better in the next 30 years. Aiming to improve the conduct of discourse online should be one way to achieve that goal. Now, in recent years, many important social and political topics have played out online, from gun control, immigration, Brexit, the Trump presidency, and individual rights. We're all familiar with a scenario. You make a post on a topical subject on Facebook or Twitter and venture your opinion. A friend or acquaintance who you vaguely remember from school and who is known to have firm views on various subjects then responds with an inflammatory attack on you and your opinion, and it then escalates into a pitched battle that drags in other people until friendships have been tested, battle lines drawn, and offence taken at slights both real and imagined. Too often, what passes for argument these days merely degenerates into Pythonesque personal abuse or basic contradiction. Commenting upon the way in which the level of debate degrades online, particularly in terms of the tendency to get personal, Mike Godwin formulated one of the most famous of all internet laws, known simply as Godwin's Law. Now, his law was developed in the early days of the internet uh, on the specialist Usenet groups of the 1990s, but it has found new relevance in the world of today's web discussions. Put simply, Godwin argues that uh, the longer a discussion continues, the higher the likelihood that someone will end up comparing someone else to Hitler and the Nazis. <laughs> At which point the debate has ended. As such, Godwin's law can be described uh, as a form of ad hominem attack. Quite simply, 
getting personal, or, or otherwise warning against the use of overblown, hyperbolic arguments that misrepresent our opponent's uh, position as fascistic or Nazi, just because it disagrees with our own. Interestingly, Godwin has modified his position in response to contemporary global political events and suggests that there are politicians and issues to which such labels are now appropriate. But that's not an issue for us today. When we look at the standard of debate online these days, uh, it is too easy to get carried away uh, and to think that this was created by, by social media. It is important to remember, however, that incendiary rhetoric and incivility are not exclusive to the digital age. Winston Churchill, when castigated for being drunk, famously retorted, my dear, you are ugly, but tomorrow I shall be sober. And when the Earl of Sandwich, uh, a man whose principal claim to fame is lunch, um, said to John Wilkes, Sir, you will either die on the gallows or of the pox. To which he received the infamous reply, That, my lord, depends on whether I embrace your principles or your mistress. <laughs> what these slightly whimsical examples serve to show uh, is that personal or hyperbolic debate is not new. And we need to keep that in perspective. But we seem willingly to engage in argument. Comedian Aziz Ansari conducted an experiment as part of his stand-up show. Now, he recalled uh, a recent story in which a guy had ordered a pizza only to find, when it was delivered, that the pepperonis had been arranged in the shape of a swastika. Ansari asked the audience if they recalled the story and what they felt about it. Probing further, he asked an audience member where he thought he'd seen the story. Uh, and they asked him whether it was the Washington Post, to, to which the audience member agreed that it was, whereupon Ansari revealed that he'd made the whole thing up and there had been no such story. <laughs> what this suggests is that people are easily gulled by misinformation and quick to take a, a, a stand on a subject, even when there is slender evidence and whatever the topic might be. The willingness of people on social media to argue bears this out. It is also a truism that people tend to behave very differently online to the way in that, well, they, which would, they would behave if they were engaging with someone face to face. John Sula has written extensively on the tip, topic of behavior in uh, cyberspace. And one of the concepts that he is most closely associated with is the idea of the online disinhibition effect, which ranges from the benign variety, uh, in which people share very personal things about themselves, to the toxic, where anger, hatred, and threats are expressed by people online in a way that might surprise the people who knew them in the flesh. Now, this disinhibition effect has a profound impact upon both how we see ourselves and perhaps how we might like to be seen. Now, the effect was neatly illustrated uh, in a cartoon from The New Yorker in 1993 by cartoonist Peter Steiner, titled, On the Internet, Nobody Knows That You Are a Dog. <laughs> Something that has since become a popular meme that conveys that sense of anonymity on the web and the disinhibited behaviors that result from it. Feelings and emotions also play a big part in arguments. John Stuart Mill, the 19th century philosopher of classical liberalism and a leading proponent of utilitarianism, famously commented upon the fact that most arguments are less rooted in reason and more firmly anchored in emotion. So long as opinion is strongly rooted in the feelings, it gains rather than loses in stability, having a preponderating weight of argument against it. Put simply, when someone is emotionally invested in their argument, the less the possibility that your counter-argument will sway them with facts and figures, and most likely, you'll make the conviction that they are right all the stronger. 
In these words, Mill skillfully describes why your uncle on Twitter remains steadfastly loyal to the Second Amendment, despite your evidence of the number of school shootings, or why your grandfather on Facebook refuses to modify his position on Brexit, despite your data showing mounting economic harm. So if online arguments are so firmly rooted in emotion and so difficult to affect any change in pos uh, position from the participants, then it would seem to suggest that arguing on social media is a fruitless endeavour that doesn't help us to resolve the important issues of the day or to reach agreement on the most pressing topics of our time. In ancient Greece, students were taught how to argue well in classes of rhetoric, and Mill's eloquent words echo the ideas of Aristotle, who had expounded many centuries before what became known as the modes of persuasion, ingrained in the memory of communication students as ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos, do we believe that the speaker has credibility regarding the specific topic? Logos, does the speaker, what, what the speaker say seem logical or right in terms of the facts and the figures that they have used? And finally, pathos. Did the speaker make an emotional appeal, whether through fear or otherwise? Too often the people we are communicating with are more swayed in their arguments by pathos to the detriment of ethos and logos. And this often accounts for their unshakable conviction that they are right and that you are wrong and that nothing you will say will cause them to modify their position. Legal scholar and best-selling author Cass Sunstein argues that people exposed to the internet risk living in a virtual bubble that isolates them from other opinions and leads to a polarization of views as people talk past each other. Sunstein refers to this as living in what he terms the daily me, in which people are only exposed to the views that reinforce what they already believe and encourage them to inhabit information cocoons. Other commentators have described the digital age as one in which people occupy echo chambers or filter bubbles. Echo chambers are an environment in which political polarization, for example, is developed because people are not exposed to opposing viewpoints and just re receive opinions and perspectives that seem to confirm their own position. Christopher Bale, at Duke University, conducted a field experiment in which Democrats and Republicans were given a financial incentive to follow a bot that retweeted posts and comments that were the opposite of their own affiliation. The results were interesting and suggest that Republicans seem to express more conservative views after being exposed to a bot that gave them more liberal content whereas Democrats seem to express more liberal views after, being, after seeing more conservative posts. While it still holds a grip on popular imagination, recent research has suggested that the idea of the echo chamber may be overstated. But could arguing online actually be good for our mental health? Research by Amelia Tate in The New Statesman suggests that, it's, that it might. Well, un, well, it's unsurprising that the most common reaction to arguing online is frustration, particularly when our words are misunderstood, largely because they are delivered without the benefit of body language or intonation that can give up to two-thirds of the mean, meaning. But interestingly, 11.2% of the respondents uh, suggested that arguing online made them happy, whereas 64.9% responded that they enjoyed reading other people's arguments online. <laughs> now, while more research is needed in this area, the conclusions suggest that those already vulnerable may experience negative con con uh, consequences from online arguments. 
But for most people, the negative consequences are short-lived, and some even have positive gains from participating and spectating. These results are interesting, but far from conclusive. But there are some bright spots on the horizon, and several projects aimed at making the web a better place for the conduct of discourse have emerged in recent years. Writing in 2008, Paul Graham, author and technology investor, penned a seminal article on how to argue online, titled, How to Disagree. Graham observed that while the internet was becoming a place where conversations occurred, there was a lot more disagreement happening than agreement. This he attributed to the fact that agreeing tended to motivate people far less than disagreeing. So if disagreement is a fundamental truth of how online arguments are conducted, Graham wants to help people to disagree well. And while he believes that most people know the difference between name-calling and refuting the central point of the argument, Graham developed a seven-level system called the disagreement hierarchy. This hierarchy starts at DH0 with simple name calling. DH1 is the ad hominem attack, getting personal. DH2 addresses the content but attacks the tone, whether dismissive, cavalier, or facetious. DH3 is contradiction. DH4 is counterargument, and DH5, refutation. According to Graham, however, the pinnacle of the hierarchy of disagreement is DH6, in which you refute the central point of the argument. Graham believes that if people are exposed to a clear categorization of types of argument and made to understand that a hierarchy exists, then they can start to modify their behavior accordingly. <coughs> now, while Graham looks at behavior, Others have sought to address the medium in which arguments are conducted. In 2013, Scottish teenager Cal Turnbull started a discussion group on the social media platform Reddit. The basic premise of the group was to encourage people to post their views on a range of different, different topics. And when the post went live, other Reddit users then responded. Topics range from someone arguing that taxation should be used to cover the cost of pollution, to whether Western tourists should wear headscarves in the Middle East, or even that female employees should be paid more by their firms. From that original group, changeofview.com is, is now a funded startup that seeks to overcome conflict and polarization online. The rules are simple and echo Graham's hierarchy of disagreement, in which users are encouraged to explain their reasoning and challenge central propositions rather than attack the person, the tone, or just contradict them. Change of view also seeks to change our attitude to being wrong, as well as encouraging a greater civ civility to the conduct of online discourse. And so, Arguments that are persuasive or likely to encourage people to reconsider their views are awarded a delta rather than a like, which stems from the Greek symbol for change. While the site has received high-profile support from former US President Barack Obama and Tesla CEO uh, Elon Musk, the latter has also suggested, however, that the people who need to use it most are probably the ones least likely to click on it. Data scientist and blogger John Nurst believes that the dynamics of how people argue online, the effects of anonymity, and the ease with which misunderstandings occur is worthy of its own field of study. He has called this fledgling new field erisology, or, or the, the study of disagreement, which comes from the Greek god Eris, who was fabled as the goddess of discord, who achieved her aims by sowing disharmony through often ambiguous and misinterpreted prophecies. The hope is to try and understand how people react to the world in different ways because of the divergence in their fundamental 
assumptions and beliefs. Now, the work of Paul Graham, Cal Turnbull, and John Nurst can perhaps be seen as continuing the great traditions of the ancient Greeks with a mission to improve the conduct and the conditions in which rhetoric occurs. Other research shows that the polarization of online discourse is often less pronounced when people just debate each other in the real world. Nevertheless, if we are to deliver the vision of Tim Berners-Lee, then trying to shape a more conducive online environment for debate is a helpful step in the right direction. If social media is our go-to medium for debating important topics these days, then at least we can rearrange the furniture in this room in which we come to argue and hopefully reduce the occasions on which someone or their ideas are compared to Hitler. Thank you.